Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Andrew Zorneman, president of McCain Academy, and I'm just so happy that everybody could join us tonight for the great seminar webinar. And tonight, we're talking about how to lead a seminar discussion using the find the argument method. And I hope you'll find this really useful, especially if you teach any kind of expository literature, philosophy, theology, sometimes history, ethics, uh, politics, any one of those uh, liberal disciplines uh, just might be an area uh, for which you have selected a classic work of expository literature and you want to lead your students through it strategically so that they understand the text, that they've got a very good grasp of the fundamental arguments, concepts, and conclusions and analyses that the great writers have left us in their classic works. Um, I want you to know that at the end of the great seminar webinar tonight, we got a little treat for everybody who shows up. We have a, um, a special uh, discount code, and um, I'll announce what that is. And uh, for a short period of time on our website, uh, if you joined us tonight, then uh, you'll have access to a wonderful code uh, that will give you a discount on a purchase. So a little something, a little treat uh, to wrap up the night. So stay tuned. Don't leave early. <laughs> So what I'm going to do tonight, uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen in just a minute. And <clears throat> what I'm going to do is go through four selections from four classic expository works. And in each of the selections, I'm going to find the argument. And um, I'm going to talk about the argument. I'm going to talk a little bit about the teaching strategy that would lead your students into the text to find that argument. So give me a second here while I get set up. And I'm going to share my screen. All right, so again, tonight we're uh, learning how to lead a seminar with the find the argument method. All right, I've, I'd like to recommend to you that if uh, you haven't read it yet, there's a, a great resource from Kane Academy called The Lively Kind of Learning, Mastering the Seminar Method. It was written by my better half, my wife, Jeanette, and uh, one of our uh, master teachers uh, here at Kane Academy. And in uh, one section, uh, she articulates six patterns, or you could call them methods, by which to teach a seminar. And uh, finding the argument is one of them. The first thing that we do when we're leading students into the text is, is to ask them some kind of question that has to do with what the writer is arguing. Now, there are at least two general uh, ways to approach this. One, you could say, what's he writing about? What's his subject? What's his topic? What's the, the thing in reality or the experience in reality that he's trying to expound on? Or what is his thesis? Now, sometimes a writer will say right up front what his point is, and then he'll make his case. At other times, he'll ask a question about uh, the topic, and then he'll make his way uh, methodically until he gets to an answer. Uh, you might say that the answer at the end or the thesis at the beginning, one and the same thing. But either way, uh, in order to understand what he says, we have to understand why he says it. And the way to understand why an author says what he says about a topic is to find the argument. Let's look at an example. James Madison's Federalist Paper number 10. Now, you know, the Federalist Papers uh, were written uh, to sway the American public to embrace the uh, new Constitution. And uh, there were three authors, uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, John Jay, and James Madison. Madison wrote this particular Federalist paper, and the topic is factions. Uh, and he'll explain what a faction is. So as we look through this a little passage, here's some questions that we need to be able to answer. What does Madison mean by a faction? What's the relationship between a faction and government? in particular, Republican government, that is the kind of government that the founders have established. If the relationship is a negative one, if it's a problem, how does Madison respond to that? In particular, what's the solution to the problem? And finally, what do you, careful reader, think about Madison's explanation of a faction, and what do you think about his solution? So let's read this little passage, and we'll talk about uh, making our way through uh, the argument. By a faction, I understand 
a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest, adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. There are two methods of curing the mischiefs of faction. The one by removing its causes, the other by controlling its effects. There are again two methods of removing the causes of faction. The one by destroying the liberty which is essential to its existence. The other by giving to every citizen the same opinions, the same passions, and the same interests. It could never be more truly said than of the first remedy that it was worse than the disease. Liberty is to faction what air is to fire, an element without which it instantly expires. But it could not be less folly to abolish liberty, which is essential to political life because it nourishes faction, than it would be to wish the annihilation of air, which is essential to animal life because it imparts to fire its destructive agency. The second expedient is as impracticable as the first would be unwise. As long as the reason of man continues fallible, and he is at liberty to exercise it, different opinions will be formed. As long as the connection subsists between the reason and his self-government, I'm sorry, between his reason and his self-love, his opinions and his passions will have a reciprocal influence on each other, and the former will be objects to which the latter will attach themselves. The diversity in the faculties of men from which the rights of property originate is not less an insuperable obstacle on a uniformity of interests, that is, to a uniformity of interests. The protection of these faculties is the first object of government. From the protection of different and unequal faculties of acquiring property, the possession of different degrees and kinds of property immediately results and from the influence of these on the sentiments and views of the respective proprietors, ensues a division of the society into different interests and parties. Wow, what an amazingly packed three paragraphs. I started with this one because uh, typically uh, this, this falls into a course that would be read by younger students, <clears throat> maybe ninth graders or perhaps 10th uh, graders. We begin with that first question that I asked, what does Madison mean by a faction? And it's interesting that he uses the language of common impulse, passion, or interest. That is, and you could have a group that's relatively small or simply a group that's a minority, which means it's less than the majority. It's less than, say, half of, of the country. And then it could be the majority. Any kind of faction at any one of those levels, however, can be a real threat to Republican government. Why? Because internal to that group's interests lies an adversity, an adversity that potentially can uh, obscure or endanger the rights of others. Or it might even endanger, because it takes as its own priority, its interests, over the common good. So those are two dangers of faction. And, and this is why uh, Madison is so keen to find a solution to it. Now, factions, he clearly thinks, are natural, but they're also naturally problematic. That is, he doesn't think they're somehow out of the realm of, of uh, human action, human choice, human interest, human path. He's talking about something inherently human. And yet, he thinks there needs to be some kind of response to it that we would call a problem solution. But if a faction is naturally a problem, could there be a cure that meets the natural uh, state of things. Well, there are two possible cures. One is to remove the cause altogether. The other one is to control the effects of factions. Let's go to that first one, to remove the cause. And he offers um, one possibility that somehow or another you just destroy liberty. Just don't let anybody join into groups, small, uh, just under uh, half the size of the country, or the majority. Uh, don't allow any kind of factions uh, and don't allow the liberty that would fuel them. Well, he says that's problematic. And he says, you don't throw factions out any more than you would uh, throw air out. Yeah, air, of course, is what fuels a fire. And, uh, you know, fire is destructive. 
But air is also what gives life to animals, all kinds of animals, uh, those that we use on our farms and uh, those that might attack us in the wilderness. But we're animals too. So we breathe in the air and we get life from it. A fire breathes in the air and it gets life from the, from, uh, the air as well. But because fire is destructive, that doesn't mean we should somehow or another eliminate air. That would be silly, right? It'd be nonsense. What about the, the, the possibility of making opinions, passions, interests all uniform? In other words, we could do away with uh, factions if we simply made everything completely one. There'd be no divisions, no personal interest, no group interest, nothing like that. And, and that's distinct from sort of taking away the liberty uh, to choose uh, factions. Well, he says something else about nature. Just like, remember, he's, he's using the language of nature. And that is, um, factions are natural to us. Uh, liberty is natural to factions. Liberty is natural to us, just like air is natural to us. So is diversity. Diversity of what? Diversity of opinion, diversity of passion, diversity, diversity of interest. Diversity is a given here. It's not the end. In other words, we're not driving everything toward more diversity. It's just a recognition uh, that we all embrace that there is a diversity of passion, interest, and uh, purposes. So given that there is a diversity, uh, and, and that's just part of nature, uniformity won't work. You can't make something, uh, something in nature uh, other than what it is. And in fact, a government, if it's paying attention to the natural course of things, the natural order of things, will recognize that the preservation of diversity, that is the preservation of a wide variety and, and lots of different, uh, or you could say levels, different levels of faculties, interests, purposes. Uh, and, uh, and this is why there needs to be um, a diversity of factions. So number one, you can't remove liberty. Number two, you can't remove diversity. Neither of these work because they're unnatural. So we come now to controlling factions effects. What could we possibly do? Well, he's left with this option only, and that is uh, to, uh, and he doesn't make the case here on this page. So this is, uh, this is an, an, another section soon to follow. The one thing we're left with uh, in terms of controlling factions is to not, uh, it's not to limit them, is not to ignore the diversity, it's not to not to try to squelch the liberty that would fuel factions, but to maximize factions. Uh, so again, we've worked through, first of all, the, the uh, Madisonian definition of a faction. Then we considered uh, with him how factions are a threat to Republican government. And then we've considered um, uh, two major options, one of which has two branches. That is, the first option is to remove causes, so you can either destroy liberty that fuels interests and factions, or you make opinions, factions, purposes, passions, all uniform. But both of those are unnatural. Those just won't work. So we're left with controlling factions. And that will lead us to uh, the next part of Madison's uh, argument about factions, that is to maximize the number of them. Now, when we think about this, when we evaluate the argument, you know, I asked the students, I said, what do you think of that? Do you think it is true that uh, in a society like ours, the factions are a real threat. In other words, is it is are they potentially such that they might undo the order of things, the peace that we have uh, among ourselves, and so forth? And you know, the students typically say, "Yeah, it does seem to be the case that um, you know, for example, uh, among the major parties, if one party tries to dominate and gobble up the other party and prevent it from actually playing its role, well, that could be a real problem." or if uh, too much power rests in uh, huge corporations, or if um, people are simply left to do whatever they darn well please. So even though no one or a small group of them has an enormous amount of power, collectively, if it's a society where people are just left to do whatever they want at the expense of others, that's not gonna work either. Uh, so it does seem to be the case that certain factions and many factions, um, uh, are are to be encouraged. So, for example, we start from the back there. In, in a country in which, in a society in which people can do whatever they darn well want, obviously someone's going to get hurt. Uh, they're going to be um, neglected morally, spiritually, relationally, economically. Uh, so certain uh, mediating forces need to be encouraged, and they too could be considered under Madison's terms as factions. Like what? Like churches, religions in general, uh, charity organizations, fraternal organizations, 
um, hospitals, orphanages, uh, homeless shelters, schools, all sorts of uh, uh, groups uh, that reach out to people and lift them from their uh, various states of, of burden and suffering, and uh, and also encourage them uh, to live lives for other people and not just lives for themselves. That would be one example of how a multiplicity of factions that actually be a, a good thing for everybody. We also have in the in the history of the United States, and uh, the students of American history will study this. We have a number of really important court cases that um, try to prevent uh, an excessive uh, damaging uh, mode of uh, monopoly, which would kill competition, which would kill the opportunities that some people might have uh, to establish companies and to deal in commerce. So uh, that would be another example of how Madison seems to have his, his finger on a, on a pretty good uh, approach to things. And that is, uh, rather than just let some few companies dominate the entirety of a whole economic sphere, uh, it would be uh, healthier for a country to divide those corporations or to allow competition so that others uh, could compete in those sectors. Let's go to another example, Plato's Mino. Uh, this is a, a section here. I've, I'm not going to read all two pages, but I'm going to start here where the blue arrow is on the left side of the page. Uh, Mino approaches uh, Socrates. Mino, you should know, is really enamored of uh, fancy speeches. And he's been under the spell of uh, Sophus, who wax eloquently and um, are able to uh, train, especially uh, ambitious young men, uh, so that they could live a life of fame, fortune, and uh, and power. And he, he hears about Socrates as somebody who speaks in a kind of an entertaining way. And he comes to him and he asks him a question, expecting that Socrates will give him something like one of the sophist speeches. And the question he asks him is, Socrates, can virtue be taught? And Socrates uh, sort of shakes his head and says, well, uh, let's drill down and see if we can define our terms. And uh, it takes a couple of pages before he, he finally makes some progress with Mino to, to work through what that means. That is what virtue is. So here we go at the blue arrow. Socrates, let's leave Gorgias out of this and since he was not here. But Mino, by the gods, what do you yourself say that virtue is? Speak and do not begrudge us so that I may have spoken a most unfortunate untruth when I said that I had never met anyone who knew if you and Gorgias are shown to know. Mino, it is not hard to tell you, Socrates. First of all, you want the virtue of a man. It is easy to say that a man's virtue consists of being able to manage public affairs and in so doing to benefit his friends and harm his enemies and to be careful that no harm comes to himself. If you want the virtue of a woman, uh, let's see here, I need to move my, whoops. Well, if you want the virtue of a woman, it's not difficult to describe. And he goes on to talk, describe a woman's virtue, managing the household, talks about the virtue of free men, uh, slaves, uh, every age, in fact. So there's a virtue for every action in every age, for every uh, task of ours and every one of us. And Socrates, the same is true for wickedness. So you can see he just ran out a whole big list. Socrates responds by saying, oh, I seem to be in good luck, Mino. While I was looking for one virtue, I have found you have a whole swarm of them. But Mino, to follow up the image of swarms, if I were asking you, what is the nature of bees, and you said that they are many and of all kinds, what would you answer if I asked you, do you mean that they are many and varied and different uh, one from another insofar as they are bees, or are they no different in that regard? but in some other respect in their beauty, for example, or their size or in some other such way. Tell me, what would you answer if this, if this question? Amino says, I would say that they do not differ from one another in being bees. Socrates says, ah, if I went on to say, tell me, what is this very thing, Mino, in which they are all the same and do not differ from one another? Would you be able to tell me? I would. The same is true in the case of the virtues. Even if they are many and various, all of them have one in the same form, which makes them virtues, and is right to look to this when one is asked to make clear what virtue is. Or do you not understand what I mean? Mino, I think I understand, but I, I certainly do not grasp the meaning of the question as fully as I want to. Socrates says, 
I am asking whether you think it is only in the case of virtue that there is one for man, another for woman, and so on, or is the same true in the case of health and size and strength? Do you think that there is one health for men and another for women? Or if it is health, does it have the same form everywhere, whether in men or in anything else, whatever? And Mino concedes, the health of a man seems to me the same as that of a woman. Well, isn't this a wonderful uh, a course of uh, discourse between the, uh, the two interlocutors? The, the original question of the dialogue, can virtue be taught, is a, is a question that we, uh, uh, we say uh, includes something that begs the question. That is, you can't proceed to answer the question, can virtue be taught, without explaining the term virtue. So Socrates begins with a question, what is virtue? And Mino says, well, there are many and various virtues. He doesn't say what virtue is. He just lists off what he thinks are a whole bunch of them. Or really, he says, there is really, a, you might say, a variety of people, of humans, um, and for each one, there's a kind of virtue. And uh, he might say that Mino says there's evidence of virtue in the variety, that because they're men, they're women, they're children, they're slaves, they're free men, etc. In fact, there, there's even uh, something proper uh, you could say something similar about wickedness. That is, there are wicked men, women, wicked women, wicked, wicked people at all ages, uh, wick, wicked people in all walks of life. So there's a variety of wickedness too. <laughs> so he's got the vices covered, not just the virtues. Well, Socrates comes back and he, he tries to draw an analogy. He said, well, wait a second. If, if the virtues are various, and that's the only way we can understand them, what about bees? There are all kinds of bees, but wouldn't we say there's something about being a bee that makes all bees bees? And in fact, Mino says, absolutely, there's something about bees that makes all bees bees. And then Socrates draws it out further, uh, and he comes back to uh, categories of health, age, uh, size, etc. And uh, so when you look at um, a healthy man or you look at a big man, you look at a, um, a, uh, a, a, a healthy uh, woman or a petite woman, uh, nonetheless, uh, there seems to be, a, you know, size uh, is is something you know by which we we measure uh, a person, and uh, health is uh, common to a person uh, who lacks disease and has, you know, uh, all of his or her, no matter how old or young, um, uh, attributes or physical attributes are working well. And uh, and Mino concedes, yeah, okay, yeah, health is health, and uh, size is size. And so uh, just like, you know, bees are bees. Uh, it's interesting, uh, and, and uh, now by inference, uh, Socrates has gotten Mino to the point where he says, okay, now we can say that there is something we call virtue. Now, and, and, the, and what's really wonderful about this is that he's kind of cracked through the first response. That is, when, he, when Socrates asks Mino, what is virtue? And, and Mino responds by saying, uh, or listing out a whole series of individuals, and there must be a virtue property each person, uh, then uh, uh, Socrates kind of cracks through that, breaks through that, and he says, well, that still begs the question. So let's go at bees and health and size and so forth. And uh, isn't there something comparable in virtue? And uh, you you would think this is a good common ground then to proceed. As it turns out, Mina's going to continue to have a hard time Maybe he uh, doesn't have the willpower or the strength to uh, work through uh, the argument to the point of getting clarity about virtue. But uh, that's a pretty good start to an argument. And when uh, I take the students through and I ask them, I said, what do you, what do you think about those analogies? Um, they said, well, that is pretty good. Our, you know, our language is such that we look at a variety uh, and we say, those are all bees. Just like uh, the, the, my 11th grade students will say, I remember, Mr. Zorneman, when we were in life science in middle school and the teacher sent us out and we collected all sorts of leaves and uh, pine cones and things. We'd come in, we'd line up, you know, we'd have several dozen leaves and we'd line them all up. We'd say, wow, these all look very similar to each other. And these are oak leaves, right? And these are maple leaves and these are elm leaves and so forth. And in other words, and, and the leaves, uh, because it was fall, would be different colors, they would be different sizes, 
they would be along different levels of deterioration. And yet they were all leaves. And those that were oak were all oak leaves. You know, by gum, you could always draw that conclusion. And on any given day, you know, if, uh, if the students were all healthy or most, mostly healthy, it didn't matter what size they were or if they had different birthdays, different names, different families, uh, all the students were uh, healthy. I mean, everybody knew what health meant. So that seemed like a pretty good start to their mind. They thought that was a, a pretty good way to, to, to cut to the chase. Let's come to Aristotle, and uh, he's going to pick up the ball and talk more about uh, virtue. And uh, uh, this is the end of book one and the beginning of book two. Let's just read a little bit about virtue at the end of book one. Virtue it's, is differentiated in line with this division of the soul. And he's, he's gone through the division of the soul. Uh, so the soul has an intellect, the soul has a will, uh, has uh, an appetitive uh, part to it, etc. We call some virtues intellectual and others moral. Theoretical wisdom, understanding, and practical wisdom, we, what we might call prudence, are intellectual virtues, that is, their excellences of the mind. Generosity and self-control, however, are moral virtues, their excellences of the will. In speaking of a man's character, we do not describe him as wise or understanding, but as gentle or self-controlled. Like, and, and, and the students immediately recognize this, because you could have a really smart kid who's a, a bit on the nasty side. He's irritable or he gets quick to anger. Uh, he might be really bright and he could do amazing work on, on grass, huge amounts of material in math, science, literature, history, language. He can memorize all the lines in a play, but he might be exceedingly difficult to work with, right? So we, we he's lacking uh, what we would call character, moral character anyway. Now, uh, Aristotle is going to elaborate on the moral virtues here in book Two, chapter one. Virtue, as we've seen, consists of two kinds, intellectual virtue and moral virtue. Intellectual virtue or excellence owes its origin and development chiefly to teaching, and for that reason requires experience and time. Moral virtue, on the other hand, is formed by habit, ethos, and its name, ethica, is therefore derived by a slight variation from ethos. This shows, too, that none of the moral virtues is implanted in us by nature. For nothing which exists by nature can be changed by habit. For example, it is impossible for a stone, which is a natural downward movement, to become habituated to moving upward, even if one should try 10,000 times to inculcate the habit by throwing it in the air. Nor can fire be made to move downward, nor can the direction of any nature-given tendency be changed by habituation. Thus, the virtues are implanted in us neither by nature nor contrary to nature. We are by nature equipped with the ability to receive them, and habit brings this ability to completion and fulfillment. Well, he begins uh, uh, in the realm that Socrates and Mino were in, and that is the realm of, of virtue. And uh, what's, what's really interesting beyond the distinction between intellectual and moral virtue is the question of which one can be taught. Uh, and... Uh, uh, this is a very interesting question because a lot of people say, well, of course you can teach moral virtue. Of course you can teach intellectual virtue. They both can be taught. And, and of course, uh, when I ask the students, is they say, you know, my, my dad and mom taught me to, uh, to sit up straight and to, to work hard and tell the truth and to pray and things like that. And, you know, and they taught me early on by age seven or eight, I, I was kind of habitually praying, habitually telling the truth, habitually doing this and that. And, um, uh, and so there is a kind of teaching, but um, notice what uh, Aristotle calls an intellectual virtue. What does it have to do with? Well, in the first section over there at the end of book one, he says, yeah, theoretical wisdom, understanding, practical wisdom. So, so in theoretical wisdom, uh, one uh, knows how to explain not only what something is but why it is how it came to be right they really give a thorough account of things well that's different and how do you end up forming a theory say in biology or mathematics or history or uh you know philosophy well you're going to have to learn an awful lot in any one of those fields you have to come really become a master not just a basic knowledge but uh to be uh, well into uh, the depth of any one of those liberal disciplines 
and uh, being you know being in a position to argue with the best minds uh to form practical wisdom you have to know uh not only um well i should say not only you, you have to know the right ends toward which moral action are directed uh, moral action is directed and uh, for example um uh, you have to know something about uh the difference between uh, courage and its deficiency, courage and its excesses. And, uh, you know, courage is is how we're supposed to respond in the face of great danger, especially uh, danger to our lives. An excess would be reckless. That is, you would throw yourself in harm's way without any consideration of your life and uh, without really any uh, eff effectiveness either. A deficiency would be cowardice. That is, you would run or you would cower from the threat. But courage is hitting that moral mean, and uh, it's the movement of the will in the face of death toward its proper purpose, that is, to defend life, to, to defend um, one's uh, city against um, attackers and so forth. Uh, if uh, you were a political ruler, you'd have to know that you know, you're supposed to lead toward justice and toward the common good, that is, the good of everyone involved, uh, not just your own benefit. Uh, but all those things require a lot of uh, study. Um, the, in fact, the Nicomachean Ethics were written as uh, lectures, really, for adult men and experienced men. That is, a, what in Greek, they would call them strategoi. These would be men who uh, were uh, already trained and experienced as leaders, uh, they're not for schoolboys, really. Uh, so uh, that's a different kind of uh, education than, say, the, the moral education that parents give their children. But um, what's the heart of the matter is that intellectual virtues can be taught. And uh, this is why, you know, the, the disciplines, philosophy, theology, history, mathematics, science, uh, fine arts, these are all uh, teachable fields. And they're, they're all uh, involved with the training of the mind. And uh, whereas uh, moral training is, is more, practically speaking, uh, a matter of family, neighborhood, uh, clan, uh, church, et cetera. Uh, and he makes the, um, having made this distinction, uh, how then are moral virtues actually uh, taught or how do they, how are they cultivated uh, in us? And he says, by habits. Uh, habits uh, that, so moral virtues are not ours by nature. That is, we're not born with courage or born with um, temperance, you know, we don't, uh, but rather uh, habitually we, uh, uh, we do uh, things that are courageous. Habitually, we uh, we eat in, in moderation, we drink in moderation, we do all, all things appetitive in moderation. And eventually, this becomes what we call second nature. That is, it's, it's uh, who we are. It's part of our character. Now, you can't change nature. So when we say that we're not, uh, we don't have... Um, moral virtues naturally it's not to say the moral virtues are at odds with nature what we do have he says is the capacity or the ability to receive virtue or the the ability to develop fulfill and complete um our nature so that we are um habitually virtuous that is a uh, uh, virtue is, is a mark of our character and, and it is in you know in uh, kind of popular parlance uh second nature to us that's a pretty good explanation of things. And when I ask my students if that sounds true to them, they say, yeah, that does sound true. And um, it's a sad thing. They recognize when when some people are not afforded the opportunity to, to grow in moral virtue. Uh, it's also a sad thing when uh, people are not given a good education and their, their capacity for knowing things and understanding things and being wise about things that people ought to be wise about. Uh, all remain undeveloped. That's a terrible, terrible uh, poverty that marks uh, a lot of lives, and it gives a great uh, impetus to all of us who are teachers to really work hard. We come now to a final uh, excerpt, and that's from Rousseau's On the Social Contract, Book One, uh, Chapter Three. And this is um, a classic passage in which he deals with a classic uh, position about politics, and that is the claim that might makes right or the right, uh, those who are right are those who are the strongest. So let's read a little bit of Rousseau and work through his argument. The strongest man is never strong enough to remain forever the master unless he transform his might into right and obedience into duty. 
Hence, the right of the strongest, a right that is ostensibly understood ironically and actually established as a principle. But will anyone ever explain the word to us? Force is a physical power. I do not see what kind of morality can result from its effects. Yielding to force is an act of necessity, not of will. It is at most an act of prudence. In what sense could this be a duty? Let us suppose for a moment that this alleged right exists. I say that nothing but inexplicable nonsense results from it. For as soon as what as soon as might makes right, the effect changes along with the cause. Any new force that overcomes the first also inherits its rights. As soon as it becomes possible to disobey with impunity, it is possible to disobey legitimately. And since the strongest is always in the right, it is only a question of behaving so that one may be the strongest. But what kind of right is one which perishes when the force behind it ceases to exist? If force makes it necessary to obey, it is no longer necessary to obey out of a sense of duty. If a person is no longer forced to obey, he's no longer obligated to do so. So uh, this is one of the arguments that starts off with a thesis. The strongest man cannot remain so and uh, be master, that is ruler, unless his might becomes right and obedience of others to him becomes duty. So he introduces a language of distinction. He distinguishes between the language of might, and for that he uses uh, obedience uh, and um, uh, and uh, in, in terms of the language of right, he uses the language of duty. That is, uh, people will obey you if it's strictly a matter of might. Uh, they will find uh, doing what they're told to do to be their duty if they find that your uh, rule is a matter of right. So right and duty is, is moral language. Uh, not so clear that uh, the language of obedience and might uh, is moral language. There are two major parts of his, his counterargument here. Number one, force is a pure, unadulterated physical power. It could be the force of a gun to a man's head. It could be the physical size of a man strong-arming another man. Uh, it could be the force of many against the one or the few. And uh, the, the, the use, uh, or that is the means by which um, people uh, end up doing what they're told to do is coercion. That is, they're obedient because it's a necessity. Uh, somebody puts a gun to your head and tells you to give them, give that, give them uh, your wallet. You give them the wallet. Uh, it's partly out of prudence, of course. You don't want to lose your life. But there's no sense in which you're using your free moral will, your... He said, "Oh yeah, this is a good thing to do, and I'm I'm cooperating with another uh, moral agent here." No, you're you're under the coercion of of gunfire, and uh, that's a very uh, um, constrained situation. It's a situation without true freedom. Uh, so, and coercion is is always a, a factor in uh, you know sh a raw force. Secondly, uh, one level of force. Uh, meets another level of force, and uh, the, it may claim right, but if it's overwhelmed by the other level of force, then it, it basically makes nonsense of the early claim of right. So say it's it's I am in the right with my level of force, and somebody comes along with a greater level of force, and and he or they take over, and uh, suddenly I can't claim either. I have neither the force nor the right. So that I don't have the force to overwhelm somebody else means that my claim that, that Mike makes right or that my right to rule rests on my, my force uh, is suddenly upended. It makes no sense at all because, uh, because force uh, is upended by a greater force and then right to rule by dint of force transfers to the next level of force and on and on and on. And it's, it's a circular thing. It can't end. Uh, and so one who rules by force can't go on claiming to have right uh, and to uh, warrant a dutiful response uh, because, number one, um, force is not moral language or the language of force is not the language of, of uh, morality. And number two, it's fleeting. It's not lasting. It's unstable. And uh, there, uh, Rousseau has done a good job undoing the whole argument that uh, was in the air uh, in the 18th century uh, passed down uh, chiefly uh, by Thomas Hobbes. Uh, and there's still people who really believe that it's just because they had the bigger army or um, the greater wealth 
or the larger reputation, all, all, all concerns, by the way, of the sophists and, uh, you know, so as concerns of antiquity, not just concerns of modernity. Uh, people who think they can rule by uh, dint of those things are, in a sense, not living according to reality, uh, at least not living according to moral reality. Some people say they are living according to political realism, and uh, that's just the way things uh, roll. So power meets power, and it's the, the greater power that overwhelms. But it is the case that it's not moral language. So Rousseau's got his finger on things that you can't predicate to force the language of right nor to obedience the language of duty. Something else Rousseau maintain, maintains uh, has to give uh, right and duty their substance. Uh, it has to be something beyond force. And he'll go on to uh, talk about those things. You may or may not agree with him, but uh, he has certainly led us into a very interesting set of arguments. Okay, so I'm going to uh, stop uh, sharing and I'm going to um, go ahead and uh, expand my screen again. I'm, I'm glad that um, we've come to this point. We're down to... Um, um, we're down to the time now where we can uh, consider, uh, you know, question and answers if you have any. So um, uh, if you uh, want to talk about uh, anything, be sure and, and put a question uh, in the, uh, the, the Q&A there. Uh, I did want to, to say uh, before we're out of here today uh, that we have a little treat for everybody who's joined us today. Uh, and there's, if you go to our shop and you're interested in buying any one of the um, of the uh, the guides that we have, and by the way, we have guides on the Federalist Paper, on Plato's Mino, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, and Rousseau's On the Social Contract. We have beautiful guides uh, that'll help you lead your students uh, into a great discussion. Each of the guides introduces the uh, you as the teacher to the text, to the author, uh, to general challenges of, of leading a discussion on that text. And then uh, book by book by book, chapter by chapter by chapter, gives you a whole set of questions that you as a teacher should answer before you lead your students into a discussion. And then from those questions, you can select what you want uh, to uh, use in the classroom with your students. In other words, you can select questions by which you run your discussions. Let's say you want to buy one of those guides and... Um, he would like to uh, um, uh, even buy all of them. And you have a special uh, code here today, and it's called argument, all in uppercase. So if you go to the shop and you buy the, the guide uh, on the Federalist paper, on Plato's Mino, Aristotle's Ethics, or Rousseau's on the Social Contract, when you check out, be sure and use that uh, discount code called argument, and you'll get a 20% discount. Now, if you buy a whole bunch of guides, uh, and you uh, go over $100 in purchase price, well, I'm happy to say you get an automatic 30% discount. So that's very cost effective. In any case, we have uh, over 60 guides on the website that can be great service to you. Finding the argument is a great way to lead a seminar discussion. Uh, it, first, it follows the first principle of seminar leadership, and that is to lead your students into the text. Ask questions of any kind of text, expository or imaginative, to lead the students into the text. But because an expositor is trying to reveal something about historical reality, that is, what's, what's true in the area of, of um, moral action, what's true in the area of intellectual uh, pursuit, what's true... Uh, in the area of politics, say justice, what's true in friendship and other kinds of love, what's true about God and our relationship to him. Uh, expositors of all those kinds are laying claim uh, to uh, telling us the truth about uh, those spheres of inquiry. And so, so we, in turn, uh, have two responsibilities with our students. One is to find the argument and to see exactly what the writer says about that sphere, and then secondly, uh, to evaluate it. That is to, to think through what kind of insight, what kind of light uh, the expositor has shown. And as we discussed tonight, uh, James Madison, Plato, Aristotle, and Rousseau have all shed some light on uh, things that are all germane to us. That is, we, um, 
we all live uh, in America. We all live, uh, well, not all of us, I'm sorry. Uh, we have uh, in, an international audience, but uh, we all live in um, polities that are marked by factions. So it's good to sit up and take notice of what Madison says. Uh, we all uh, wonder about the meaning of virtue and whether or not it can be taught. And in both the Mino and the Ethics, uh, book two, anyway, have something to say about that. And um, finally, uh, we all live in the political realm uh, and recognize that there are those who claim uh, the right to rule uh, by dint of their force. And uh, we question that. We challenge it. We, we know it's not um, the uh, full account of who can rule uh, and uh, who ought to follow the rulers. We know that there, there's something off about that, and there's there's more to politics. But all those writers uh, illuminate those those fears for us. Well, I'm really pleased that everybody could show up uh, tonight. I hope you're um, either uh, already starting your school year wonderfully well, or you're about to start the school year. Um, I'm really, um, I, I just want to encourage you, and I want to... Uh, uh, really uh, tell you how thankful I am. And, and uh, all of us out here are thankful that you've taken up the calling to teach. We hope you have a great start to your school year. We hope that you continue to marshal uh, everything the Kane Academy has to offer to help you be a great seminar leader. And I hope that the great seminar webinar uh, plays some role in helping you uh, by, you know, pumping your art with more uh, skill and inspiring you perhaps to uh, to raise your game to the next level and seek the ne next level of proficiency as a seminar leader. Uh, don't be a stranger. Reach out to us at uh, www.kaneacademy.org. Uh, look for uh, more seminar webinars in the future. And uh, on behalf of the whole Kane Academy team, have a great start to your school year, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again, everybody, and have a good night.